and welcome to Wired Foresight. I'm Greg Williams, Editor-in-Chief of Wired. Today's session is part of an ongoing series of conversations with leading figures and innovative thinkers in business, science, technology, academia and policy. To really investigate the fast-paced changes the world is currently undergoing, to explore how technology will shape business and society in the coming months and years, and most importantly, to understand how we can prepare for those changes. We intend that our live briefings are punchy, they're top level discussions with a guest speaker on a key topic or theme. We know you're busy, you want concise authoritative briefings, these discussions will last roughly 25 minutes. Uh, before we begin, a couple of important points. You can submit questions throughout the session by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And this briefing is being recorded and we'll gladly send you a copy of the link uh, once the event ends. Now onto the session. Even before the global pandemic, loneliness had become one of the defining conditions of life in the 21st century. The increased use of technology, reorganization of companies, decades of governmental policies and cultural norms that have placed self-interest above collective good, all enable the world to become more connected, but are leaving societies more fragmented. In today's session, we'll explore why this global fragmentation of communities is happening and what we can help to do to reduce loneliness for ourselves and our communities. And with that, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Narina Hertz. Narina is a renowned economist, strategic thinker and best-selling author. Her books, The Silent Takeover, IOU and Eyes Wide Open have been published in more than 20 countries. Her most recent book, The Lonely Century, combines a decade of research with first-hand writing taking us from isolated remote workers in London during lockdown to nursing home residents knitting bonnets for their robot caregivers in Japan. And it offers a vision for how we can heal fractured communities and restore connection in our lives. Narina, welcome. Great to have you with us here today. Great to be with you. So, as I said, you've written books about economics, about globalisation, about decision making. What prompted you to write a book about loneliness? Yeah, it's not the most obvious um, <laughs> topic for an economist, is it? Um, it was really three distinct things that happened to me in a very short period. The first was my students. I realized or I observed that increasing numbers of my students, this is about four years ago now, were coming into my office and in office hours confiding in me that they were feeling lonely and isolated. And this was not something that I had seen at least to such a degree in the past. And I'd been teaching at university for around 20 years. So I noted it and I thought, what's going on here? At the same time in my academic research, I was researching the rise of right-wing populism across the globe. And as I started interviewing right-wing populist voters, and hearing their testimonies, one thing that kept on coming across time and time again was how lonely they felt. Lonely in the sense uh, of not having friends and having limited support networks, but also lonely in the sense of feeling invisible, unseen, unheard. And I thought, okay, loneliness um, with right-wing populist voters, loneliness perhaps affecting the kind of democracies in which we're living in, and loneliness clearly also affecting a generation who hitherto I hadn't really thought of as the lonely generation. I'd thought perhaps of elderly people as being the loneliest. And then the third reason was why I decided to really dig into this phenomenon was because I'd bought an Alexa. And apologies in advance if you have one and she's now um, going to get active. But I observed how I was interacting with my Alexa and how attached I quickly became to this little object that sits in my kitchen. And it got me thinking about what I came to call the loneliness economy, an entire economy made up of goods and services really designed to deliver connection. And something that even before the pandemic was um, nascent and rising. And um, since the pandemic has, of course, massively 
accelerated and I argue will continue to do so. So it was these three very, very distinct areas that made me think this is a subject I really want to dig into. And as I started to look at the data, I was really struck by how profound loneliness was with one in five adults saying that they felt lonely often or all of the time with one in five millennials saying that they didn't have a single friend at all with 40% of office workers saying that they felt lonely at work with three in five 18 to 24 year olds saying that they felt lonely always or often and as I started looking at this data I realized that we were really in the midst of a global loneliness crisis, a crisis that was affecting our health, our wealth, and the state of our democracy. And that's why I wanted to really dig into it. And of course, it's a phenomenon which was already bad before the pandemic, but all the data is clear on this. It's significantly worse today. Yeah, the data in the book is, is really compelling and, and the research in the book really does sort of prove the point that you're making in terms of like just the, the scale of this problem. But I'm also intrigued because there's, there's a lot of reporting that you've done as well. And I'd love if you could talk just a little bit about some, some of the people that you encountered along the way and tell some of those stories. Yeah, so it was, um, I really, um, you know, this book is full of academic research and, um, you know, really kind of best practice academic research, but it also is full of um, journalism and first-hand journalism. And I did, I crisscrossed the globe meeting uh, people who were lonely and also experiencing some of the um, products that the loneliness economy delivers. And one such product was Brittany. Um, Brittany was a young woman who I rented in New York for a few hours. I learned, yeah, I, I learned that you can rent friends. And um, there's actually a website where I found Brittany, which has over 620,000 friends to rent on it. Wow. And you now I was a bit worried before I rented her. You know, was this covert speak for something untoward? But it wasn't. And um, I met her downtown Manhattan. We drank matcha tea together. We went to a bookstore together, we went to a clothes store together and tried on hats and sunglasses. And it was, obviously it wasn't like being with an old friend, but you know, when you meet a new friend and someone new and you're kind of vibing with them and it feels really fun, well, that's what it felt like. I mean, afterwards, of course, when I reflected upon it, I thought, well, no wonder it felt good because she was laughing at all my jokes. She seemed to be so fascinated by everything I was saying. But at the time, I really didn't think of that. It's amazing the stories we tell ourselves. But until we're in the clothes store and she turns around to me and she says, time's up, that'll be $140, please. Wow. Um, but what was interesting, Greg, was when I asked her who rented her, typically, she said it was typically 30 to 40 year old professionals, um, women as well as men people working predominantly in tech, finance and consulting. Typically people who had moved to Manhattan, didn't have a support network there, didn't have a friendship network, were working very long hours and just didn't have someone to go to a movie with or go and have a cup of coffee with at the weekend and decided to rent a friend. So that that was one of, that was just one of the um, people who I met in my journey. I also, um, you know, I was interested in, and it's something, of course, you know, that Wired is very interested in and, and, and its readers. I was very interested in um, understanding better this evolving future in which robots are going to um, play ever greater lives, um, not only as our friends, but also as our co-workers. And um, to that end, I went to California and um, met Flippy, who's the world's first burger flipping chef. And, um, you know, so I was in this fast food joint hanging out with Flippy, who in many ways is really the ideal employee because he you know, doesn't need a vacation. He never needs time off. He, um, he always uses the correct spatula for raw meat and cooked meat. Um, so from the, um, company's point of view um, that was that was employing him um, he was a great hire but when I um, but I couldn't help thinking about his co-workers and how would the workplace feel for them when um, there were ever less human co-workers as we're seeing um, 
in, in, in several companies already and increasingly increasing numbers of robots um, now as your co-workers who are always bound to perform better than you. You mentioned um, with your encounter with, with Brittany, the fact that uh, she was kind of uh, meeting people in their 30s and, and 40s who worked in professional services or in technology. Um, I, I'm intrigued from your research. Do you think that loneliness affects all generations equally or are there kind of, you know, the, the lumps in the data, as it were? So what we know empirically is that the young are actually the loneliest generation. So if we're talking about what I call Generation K, um, so the post-millennials, or if we're talking about, um, let's say up to about age 35 of the millennials, this category um, is the loneliest. And, um, and there are a number of reasons why that would be so. The most obvious, of course, being smartphone usage, mm -hmm. which is highest amongst this demographic. And, you know, I was really um, agnostic beginning my research as to whether smartphones actually played or, um, a role in today's loneliness crisis. But I've come away from the research feeling, you know, very clear that they do. And in fact, there was fascinating research done at Stanford uh, in 2019, where they had 1500 students charged with using Facebook as usual, and 1500 charged with deleting Facebook for two months, and they tracked what happened to the students. So it was a real gold standard of a study. And what they found unambiguously was that the students who went off Facebook were significantly less lonely, and significantly happier too. And do you think that that correlation between social media use and loneliness is something that we can combat just by not being on social media, not spending so much time on our phones, or is it is something more kind of profound and fundamental going on in people's lives at the moment, do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is we all know by now that social media platforms are designed to be addictive like slot machines. Um, and so it's actually, even though I, I do try and restrict my social media usage and I do try and take a digital Sabbath one day a week, stay offline, um, and I do try and put my phone um, in a basket in the evenings, I actually feel myself reaching out for my device. I think when it comes to children, that's where I'm particularly concerned. When children are forming their sense of self um, on the basis of how many likes they have and how many follows they have and whether people are um, seeing their posts and whether they're being excluded from social media for when when that, and that is going on to a considerable degree. I mean, I have poignant stories in my book of teenagers who I interviewed, people like 14-year-old Peter who told me about how he would post on Instagram and then be waiting, hoping for somebody to like one of, one of his posts and when they didn't, just berating himself and feeling so invisible um, and saying, what am I doing wrong? So I think when it comes to children, in the same way that tobacco is regulated, I think we should look at social media companies as the tobacco companies of the 21st century and regulate them accordingly. And there are um, you know, clear moves going on on that front in the United Kingdom with the new legislation. Sure. Um, that was announced in the Queen's speech, but it's not just about social media. You know, this problem is um, about the fact why we're so lonely today is because um, because we do less with other people than in the past. Mm. We're less likely to go to church. We're less likely to be members of trade unions. We're less likely to be, go to parent teacher association meetings. That's part of the problem for sure. Um, it is partly technology, not only social media, but our increasing ch choice, decision to lead what I call a contactless life. Mm. So th this was something, of course, we saw before the pandemic. So, you know, choosing to order your food on Deliveroo rather than go to a cafe, ordering your food on a cardo rather than going to the supermarket, Amazon rather than going to your local bookstore. Of course, the pandemic, as we know, has massively accelerated this race to contactless. And what we know, what is clear from research is that we need face-to-face -face interactions if we are to feel connected to others. And even a 30 second exchange with a barista in a local cafe um, makes us feel significantly 
more connected. So it's partly to do with the choices we make and it's partly to do with our mindset really over the past few decades. Well, what we might think of as a neoliberal mindset that has taken hold where we've increasingly come to see ourselves as competitors rather than collaborators, as takers rather than givers, as hustlers rather than helpers, a kind of me first, me focused mindset which inevitably was going to beget a lonelier world. And we, we even see this in pop song lyrics, Greg, which since the 1980s have become steadily more individualistic with words like we, us and our supplanted by words like I, me, myself. So lots of factors combined. That's super interesting. I love that, that data point. I mean, really, would you trace this back then to what, the 80s, the, the, the Reagan Thatcher sort of era where, you know, no such thing as society, only individuals? Have we kind of constructed this almost, uh, you know, in, in, in that kind of macro sense? Yeah, I mean, loneliness clearly does have structural drivers, um, which kind of our ideological mindset clearly plays a part as to um, do the um, economic outcomes um, under neoliberalism, which, as we've seen, have exacerbated um, wealth and inequality gaps. Everyone can be lonely, rich or poor, but we do know that loneliness um, is more likely if you are unemployed or if you are mm -hmm. um, on a relatively low income. But um, so it's partly to do with... Um, you know, this kind of ideological construct, but it's also partly to do with choices made post 2008, um, since the financial crisis in particular, the decision, and this is something we see all across the world, the decision to really massively radically underfund what we might think of as the infrastructure of community, public right. libraries, public parks, youth clubs, day centers, community centers, elderly day centers. You know, people need physical spaces to be together if they are to feel connected. And also if we are as a society to be able to come together again. Yet in the United Kingdom in 2019, 130 public libraries were closed down, for example, right. just in that year. So, you know, there's, there's decisions that governments have made. There are choices we've made as individuals. And of course, the workplace has been an incredibly lonely place for many employees, even before the pandemic. As I said, 40% of office workers were feeling lonely. And, and do you think that that loneliness is that the workplace loneliness? I was going to kind of get, get into that a little bit. Is that driven by um, the, the individuality that we're, we're, we're championing? And, and, and the, I guess referring back to the question that I just asked, or is that also related to technology. So the fact that we have all these kind of collaborative platforms now that we can communicate on, whether that's um, Slack or, 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 or email um, or Zoom as you know, we're talking to each other today, uh, is, is technology playing a part or is there a, something else going on here? Just more about the kind of work we do and the way that it means that we're not in contact with each other any longer. Yeah, I think it's a few, again, it's a few factors at play for why the workplace became so lonely. Um, again, it's partly because people do, do less and have been doing less um, socially in the workplace than in the past. So, for example, people eat together less um, than, right. um, than in the past. And a fascinating research in Chicago with firefighters showed that companies of firefighters who ate together not only felt significantly more bonded to each other, but also performed twice as well as companies of firefighters who didn't. So eating together, you know, something you don't really think about playing a significant role. Open plan offices, I mean, you know, my kind of bet noir after doing the, um, after researching this subject, you might think of open plan offices as engendering more collaboration and more communication by people, but actually it turns out that the opposite holds true and that in open plan offices, people speak to each other um, far less in person than they do, than they would have done hitherto. Um, and actually communicate much more by email or Slack or other forms of messaging, forms of messaging that we know are inferior to face-to-face -face interaction. I think that's the point. Um, you know, right. it, it, on the one hand, this is great that we're on Zoom and we're doing this, but 
it would be better if we were in the flesh doing it because the level of communication would be different I'd be able to see your arms crossed you know your legs what kind of what signals are you giving me I can't get those kind of signals and I can't feel as close um and just on the um business point you know why why I think it's important to be talking about loneliness in the workplace isn't only because loneliness is bad for our employees mental and physical health as well but also because loneliness is bad for business yeah. Know yeah. that lonely workers are less productive, less motivated, less efficient, more likely to quit a company than workers who are not. We know that workers who don't have a friend at work are seven times less engaged with their job than workers who aren't. So addressing loneliness in the workplace makes really um, good sense from a business perspective, from a pro pragmatic um, perspective as well as if you're thinking about the um, mental health and physical health of your employees. So I want to go to questions from uh, the audience shortly, but I've got one more question. You mentioned sort of the rise of, of, of right wing populist and there being a correlation there uh, with loneliness. And there's actually one uh, question here from uh, Hugh Knowles about kind of radicalization um, through platforms um, like uh, YouTube, it, it, are we seeing really a, a strong link between sort of extreme, should we say extremism, extreme uh, political views and people are maybe what they're looking for a connection uh, where, the, where they don't have them, but have one any longer, maybe? Yeah, if we think about, you know, what do the QAnon followers, the um, folk who stormed the Capitol in Washington and the GameStop Redditors all have in common? Um, they are disproportionately made up of lonely people. Mm. And research, you know, really um, both empirically, we know this to be the case. Um, if you look, for example, at um, Trump voters, they have less friends, less acquaintances, um, even um, less people that they say they can rely upon than um, Democrat voters. Um, but also it's to do with, um, so we know that that's the case and we know that lonely people are craving belonging. And, you know, and they are finding, that's, you know, of course the scary thing, they are finding belonging um, in these more extreme groups who are wielding community like a weapon. Um, obviously it's a very exclusive and excluding form of community. But, but they're doing it effectively. Speaking both to the kind of blunt metrics of loneliness, as in don't have very many friends and physically on their own, so limited social networks, but also speaking to that other important aspect of loneliness, that sense of being unseen and unheard. And again, this is where extremist groups um, prove to be very effective, you know, promising, pledging to be the only one who hears and sees you, you who has been otherwise forgotten. Well, we, we, we talked about a lot about the challenges and, and about the research and the data, uh, Nuria, and your you know in, incredible reporting. Um, I'm interested to sort of maybe look on the other side of this now. So we've all kind of been experiencing you know pretty something, just something quite extraordinary over the last 15 months. Clearly, it's only impacted uh, loneliness you know, in quite, quite a profound way. How do you think we can? best start resetting our social connections uh, as we start kind of emerging from this uh, this period? Yeah, um, well, there's lots that governments, businesses, and us as individuals can do. Um, just to speak to a few things, my book's full of ideas, but just to speak to a few, you know, governments definitely need to be refunding the infrastructure of community. That's a no brainer and should happen fast. And we should see a clear commitment of that. Also, I think there's an argument um, for a new tax bracket of demonstrably pro community businesses. So I'm not talking about we washing here, just stamping the brand of community on a product and service and saying that that's what it is. No, I'm talking about authentic communities that do deliver. But businesses that do that, I think, should benefit from a particular tax bracket. I think governments need to um, you know, really walk the talk when it comes to reigning in social media, given the role that they are playing in today's pandemic. When it comes to businesses, you know, who are thinking about how do we reconnect our employees, especially after this past yeah. um, 16 months, some really practical things, you know, encourage and help 
your staff to eat together and also take breaks together. We know from research that when employees take breaks at the same time of day, that makes a difference. If you are adopting some sort of hybrid um, work situation, I would really um, advise getting your staff to be in the office on the same day as each other, because then you also don't create this, um, this second class citizen um, situation, which you can do when some people are at home and some people um, are at the office. Um, I think also actively championing qualities like kindness and helping each other and caring for each other in the workplace can go a really long way. You know, this may seem airy fairy pie in the sky, but actually um, Cisco, the global tech company, they do this. They um, actually have a scheme whereby anyone up or down the company can nominate anyone else in the company who's been particularly kind or helpful for a cash reward of up to $10,000 for being kind or helpful. And Cisco's turnover is half the industry average. And it was voted last year for the fourth year running um, the best company in the world to work for. And of course, there's stuff we can do ourselves. We can try and put our phones down more and be more present with each other. We can um, nurture, actively nurture our local neighborhoods, our local stores, our local cafes, our local studios who need us desperately now more than ever, but we need them too. And we can also think about whether there's anyone in our own network who might be feeling lonely especially once we're aware of how many people are lonely and actively reach out to them and you know, arrange to meet up with them or just phone them or even just send them a text just to show that we care. So just a few ideas, um, but lots more that I cover. Um, you've very helpfully answered about three or four of the <laughs> questions coming in, uh, Noreen. Uh, there are a lot of questions about, about the workplace and work and distributed workplace and how we can kind of combat loneliness as we come back into the office. So thank you for that. Uh, there was one question um, from uh, an attendee and it was related back to social media. Um, and it's trying to pass that idea of the difference between someone being an observer, so being passive, and someone being an active user. So a lot of gaming platforms these days are obviously um, sort of almost like social networks for young people, and they they uh, they kind of like play games online with each other. Did you notice anything in your research around that? Were there were there sort of positive aspects of some areas of social media as well as uh, you know the challenges of just scrolling through and seeing? you know, other people having a wonderful time when you're, you know, sitting at home in your, in your onesie? Yeah, I think that's a really good, great question. And it is, um, it is useful to be more granular when we're talking about this. And I think um, amongst gamers, you often do see actually a really um, kind of real sense of community. That was actually a very moving story of a young boy who unfortunately died, um, who had a form of cancer. And all of these people showed up at his funeral who he had never actually met in person, but had been his friends through gaming. So, you know, there can be real connections that way. And one of the fascinating things I've been looking at during the pandemic is how people's innate craving for togetherness, um, in some cases migrated successfully um, or relatively successfully to the virtual realm. And I'm thinking, for example, of the um, 15 and a half million people who attended, Travis, who attended Travis's Scott's gig on Fortnite during the pandemic. So, you know, I do think, um, I do think there are platforms and there are way, I'm, I'm not anti-technology at all. And actually I'm excited about what entrepreneurs can do um, with technology to be part of the solution for sure. Um, but, um, but when it comes to social media per se, um, which is essentially designed to amplify hate and um, exacerbate divides and make us believe that others are more popular than ourselves. I mean, when it comes to social media, that's where I have the problem. Marina, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time today for sharing your insight. Um, it's always delightful to talk to you. Um, if you haven't read Narina's book, The Lonely Century, please do go ahead and order a copy. Highly recommended. Some really thoughtful, insightful reporting and research on what's clearly a very, very important topic. Um, if you enjoyed the session, please do check out the rest of the Wired Foresight series, which includes discussions with the Associate Professor in Philosophy at the Institute of Ethics in AI, Carissa Baez, on the power of privacy. Ipsos 
Glory CEO Ben Page on what life could look like uh, in 2025, and Sanab Karangani on the AI roadmap. Uh, all are available at wired.co.uk. Uh, a final thank you to Narina uh, for joining us today. Fascinating session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Apologies if we haven't had time to get to them. Um, thank you, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Take care.